Hi there, I'm Christine Dunbar from speechmodification.com and this is my smart American accent training. Welcome to our weekly Friday class where we take your questions regarding American English pronunciation, the American accent, and other questions to help you improve your personal and professional communication in American English. I'm glad to see everyone here. Thanks to those of you who are coming back and welcome to those of you who are new to class. It's simple to participate in the class. First of all, you can just watch and listen. Or if you have a question or a comment or something you'd like me to be talking about, you can type that in the chat box and I will be reading those as I go through the class, answering your questions and showing you lots of free resources that you can use. Um, each week we have a theme and we talk about different topics in the class. And this week we'll be talking, continuing our theme of difficult words, talking about words which you find challenging to pronounce. And we have some requests that have come in over the week. If you have a request, um, you can type it in the chat or if you're watching this as a rebroadcast, you can type that in the comments because I follow up with those and find out what people are wanting to know. I love getting your questions and comments because it helps me choose topics for the class and it helps me know which new videos to make to help you. So um, we have a couple questions. Nice to see you. Um, so again, as I said, we'll be talking about some of the requests that came in over the week. And I'll show you also how you can make those requests during the week between Fridays, uh, both on the channel page, Speech Modification Seattle, on Facebook and on my website, uh, speechmodification.com. And I also wanna talk a little bit today about some hidden sounds and spelling. So some letters that say multiple sounds and some errors that may come uh, in pronunciation because of the way things are spelled. But first we'll take the request from Lee Diana about how to pronounce uh, comparable. Uh, so this is a great example, thank you for bringing it up. Um, of how words can change when they are in different forms. So first let's look at the word compare. And in the word compare, we have a short unstressed syllable and the pair, the second syllable is stressed. So I have that clear A vowel in this and a schwa. So it would look like this in IPA with the upside down E that sounds like a, uh, and then we'd have the air. Um, compare. Um, and so my point here was that the letters don't necessarily match. We might want to think about it more as an a uh sound, compare, um, to help us get that correct. But when we look at comparable, our stress pattern, stress pattern changes. And so while we have the clear vowel a, air here and compare because the second syllable is stressed, in comparable, the first syllable is stressed, and then the errable are all short and unstressed. And so instead of um, the compare, the a, uh, the schwa vowel from the unstressed compare, we have an a ah in this one. And so it looks like ka. It's the ah vowel, and I'm going to write it this way to help you with pronunciation. Com, per, a, bull. And so these are all quick. We don't have our a anymore. No clear vowel because this is unstressed. It's reduced now just to an er, comparable. And this a says the a uh sound. So even though it looks like the word able, we don't have that clear a vowel, we have another schwa, the a uh sound. And then finally we have the ble ending, which on many words, and this word is a good example of that, has the dark final l. So I need a little bit of an a uh sound before my l, bull, bull. My tongue in the back stays down. It's a little bit different than an l at the start of the word. So comparable has a lot of different things going on with it. And for, if you struggle with this word, thinking about, is it the R sound? Is it the letters versus the, the vowel sounds? Uh, is it the rhythm, the stress pattern? And kind of figuring out which parts of it give you trouble and practicing based on those is gonna help you with pronouncing that word correctly. Um, very good example, thank you. Uh, so Susan has a question and she would like to know, um, 
if there's any difference in the mouth position of the two schwa sounds. So we have the uh and the eh, and technically there may be a slight difference between these two. So if we're looking at extreme level of detail in linguistic analysis, yes, perhaps I make these slightly different in my mouth. However, for all um, general purposes, the, the position is the same. So it's a central lax vowel where my tongue is not high or low or front or back. My voice is just on, my tongue is relaxed. It sounds like uh. Depending on the word, this one is held for a long time. So that was what I would see in words like does or just when it's stressed. And this one is just held for a short time. And that's what I see in words like above. Um, so above is a great example because both of these are the uh sound. This one is short and this one is long. So if in IPA, it looks like short schwa and long schwa above, above. Um, so yes, there may be some tiny slight technical differences about where those schwas are made, but in general, if you think of them as one sound and this one is being long and this one is being short, that's gonna help you really pronounce them correctly in all words and phrases in American English. Lots of good questions today, thank you. Um, we have a question for how to pronounce the word domestic. Um, so again, let's start with looking at which syllable is stressed. So we have second syllable stress here, domestic. Uh, so the mess is longer. It's the same as the word mess. It has vowel eh. So we're going to think of that as being the red tent vowel. And then again, domestic, even though we spell that with an O, it's a vowel schwa. It's the uh sound. So da, mess, and there's my vowel i, and the, my other common unstressed vowel sound, same as in pink pig, domestic. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty straightforward um, uh, in terms of the vowel sounds and the pronunciation there. And the second part of your question was whether or not I still do individual training via Skype. And yes, um, so one of the things I do besides teaching my free classes and putting together free resources is working with clients one-on-one, -on -one, and that type of training is individualized to your specific needs. Uh, we do an assessment of your speech and look at what your goals are, what you'd like to see improving, and um, typically people work once or twice a week um, to uh, get help and feedback and improving their speech. So you can check out information about all the different training options on my website, that's speechmodification.com. And for many people that, one-to-one uh, -one training is super helpful for getting that help and feedback on their specific needs. And um, so all the different training options are here on the store page. I also have online courses, which are video courses, where you're getting some of the same content and materials, but you're working on your own pace. Um, and those are less expensive. So um, you can check those out in on the courses page. On the store page, you can see um, some details about the different training packages for online one-to-one -one training. And um, I offer a free consultation. So contact me, let me know if you'd like to talk about your needs and I can make recommendations for what might work well for you for one-on-one -on -one training, online courses, or if you're here in the Seattle area, uh, we'll be starting some group classes again uh, in late April, if that's something that might be of interest to you. Thank you for the question. Um, we have another question. Um, she's wondering if she can get a nice ah sound if she says the eh, but with the mouth, at, mouth open about as much as for ah. Um, let's see. Yes, I think uh, this is a good point. So if we look at the vowels in the front of the mouth, we have the high lax i then the mid lax eh, and the most open ah. So for example, if I were to say bit, bet, bat, you can see how bit, bet, bat, it's a matter of the tongue being lower and my, my jaw being slightly more open. And so the ah vowel is open and in the back. And so you, what she's asking is if she's 
trying to say eh, like in bet or in red tent, but opening the mouth more like ah, will she have this ah vowel? And I believe, yes, that's a good way to approach it. That if you just think about moving from the more closed i eh, to the mid eh, and then just opening like you would for the ah, ah, and then getting the ah sound that way. Um, that's a technique that I use with my one-to-one -one clients in helping them feel the difference and hear the difference between those sounds. So I think that would be a useful, uh, good approach and it should, it should help you. Um, yes, uh, so Habib uh, would like me to pronounce uh, his last name, Azadani, and I have no idea <laughs> if I'm correct. I'm guessing that it's an Azadani, um, but that is an entirely a guess based on my knowledge of linguistics. So you can tell me if I'm correct or incorrect. But if you're thinking about how to pronounce your name in a way that Americans will uh, understand what it is and be able to visualize it and say it correctly, what I recommend is... Um, making it clear where your first name and your last name begin and end. So one error, or not really error, but one pitfall that people run into is when they introduce themselves, they may say their first and last name all at once. And that might be hard for someone who's unfamiliar with either of your names to know which is which, what then to call you. And so for Habib, I might recommend saying, hi, I'm Habib, Habib Azadani, so that people can hear, okay, Habib is the first name, and that's what we're going to go with. And then the two names are Habib Azadani. Um, the other recommendation I often make for people is to um, not necessarily change. I think you should pronounce the, your name the way it's correctly pronounced, but recognize how that might sound to the American ear if there's certain vowels or differences in how they might pronounce it. Having a word in English that's similar to your name can be really helpful. So I often will think about a, a word that rhymes or a word with a similar stress pattern and similar vowels. That just helps the American hear and visualize how your name might be spelled, how the sounds go together, and tends to help them remember the pronunciation. It's not necessarily gonna be that hard to pronounce the name for them, except that they don't have um, something to help them remember how it's pronounced. Uh, so anyway, that's a little bit hard to give um, that general piece of advice, it works better if I know your specific name and can give you information. But um, ask me more questions about that if there's something particular you wanted to know about uh, the pronunciation of your name. Oh, he's telling me I got it correct. Okay, thank you, I'm glad. Um, so Sheridan wants to know common mistakes made by Asian students. Um, and this really is gonna depend on your native language background. So depending on um, if you're uh, Chinese, Mandarin, Cantonese, Vietnamese, Japanese speaker, um, there's going to be some differences. However, there are some patterns that um, cut across many different Asian languages and actually across uh, lots of other languages besides just Asian languages. What I'm going to suggest is um, for anyone looking to have more information about what patterns happen in their language or in their speech, Again, on speechmodification.com on my store page, I have free downloads that highlight the typical accent error patterns based on your native language. And so you can look up if you're a Chinese speaker or a Korean or a Japanese speaker, and you can see, okay, these are the patterns that happen for uh, people with my native language because of the sound system in our language. If I had to generalize about Asian languages, I would say, um, depending on the language again, some of the main error patterns are the um, ends of words, the sounds being devoiced or left off. So for example, the Z sound at the end of the word might sound like an S or the D sound might sound like a T or be left off entirely. So for example, the word had might sound like ha or hat. Uh, the word was might sound more like was. Um, Asian speakers from different languages sometimes have difficulty with the R and L sounds, either interchanging them or distorting them or having um, issues with those sounds. TH sounds for some Asian speakers tend to be more 
um, incorrect tongue placement. So rather than think, we might hear you saying sink or breathe. It might sound more like breeze. Um, and uh, certainly the vowel sounds tend to be challenging. Um, so learning kind of the American vowel sound system and orienting to particular vowels can be helpful. Um, also, some of the Asian languages have accent patterns that are related to pronunciation, but also grammatical differences. So I'll hear um, at the ends of words that the plurals may drop off or the verb tenses. Um, so for example, the difference between move, moves, and moved, they may all sound like move in your accent, which makes it sound like a grammatical mistake. Or um, for plurals, uh, some Asian languages don't use plurals in the same way. So you might be saying a word like um, papers, and it would simply sound like paper or paper because um, of the R issue. So it's a little bit hard to generalize, but also on my website, you can look um, uh, on the free practice materials. I have, for some of the language, not for all, I have um, kind of a starting point where you can see um, lessons related to your language. So that's here on speechmodification.com on free practice. If you go to the online practice free trial, here on the side, I can look and see Say, for example, um, I'm a Spanish speaker, or let's go with um, with Chinese, since you were asking specifically about Asian languages. And I can see here's an article or a lesson about training for Chinese speakers. And here's the top five accent error patterns for Chinese speakers. Um, and you can see a more detailed um, look at uh, Mandarin versus Cantonese and um, materials that are related and online courses that are related. So I have those, like I said, not for every language, but for a number of different languages, there's a start page. Um, as you're looking through the free downloads and finding out about your accent error patterns, you can then look for specific videos and lessons regarding those particular patterns. And um, in my online course uh, for, um, I have a couple online courses that are language specific as well. Um, one for Indian English speakers and one for Spanish speakers. For most people, the best starting course is my six week course um, because this one has um, patterns that are cut across almost all languages and it's based on which elements of your accent are the most important to work on first for being well understood. In my opinion, uh, there, the reason having an accent may be a problem is if it interferes with communication or if people are judging you based on your accent or distracted by your accent rather than focusing on the content of what you have to say. And so the philosophy I take in this course is to think about the uh, patterns and things that you can change first and foremost to reduce the impact any potential negative impact of having an accent. Um, many, many people speak with accents successfully, are great communicators, and it doesn't present an issue for them. For those of us who have um, problems related to accent, I like to focus on the elements that can really help with the most improvement um, because I think that uh, it's very challenging to change your speech. As you know, if you've been coming to class, if you've been working on this on your own, some of these patterns, we can know the information, but it can be very challenging to bring it into our speech. And so we really wanna prioritize the things that are gonna make a difference for us and really help us, as opposed to um, being overwhelmed by all of the different things that we might be trying to work on. So that's often what I'll highlight in these classes and definitely what's highlighted in my online courses for you. So I went kind of on a long, uh, <laughs> long talk there, um, but I hope that I answered your question. Um, yes, and Sheridan is saying he wants to blend in and he's tired of people asking uh, him where he's from. And I, I run into that with most people that I talk to that initially, you know, one of the very first things people get asked is where are you from? And often it makes them feel like something's wrong with their speech or they've been working so hard to blend in and to have um, good American pronunciation, but people still can notice. And that's very frustrating. And um, I'm sorry that you're um, dealing with that. I think that 
Americans don't realize often when they're asking that question that they don't realize how it makes um, the listener feel. Um, and they have a tendency to be curious and they can notice the difference. I do think sometimes when people are asking where you're from, it's because your accent doesn't give you away. They can't really tell. They can just hear some slight differences. Um, and so they don't realize that by asking that question, it can be insulting or, um, or problematic. And I do try to inform people <laughs> about that, but that is a typical question from Americans. So um, I empathize with you. Um, okay, so uh, we have some other questions and comments. Um, uh, one was that, what about Arabic? Yes, we do have um, a, a download for Arabic speakers. And um, some of the main issues for Arabic speakers are um, the P sound at the beginning of words or anywhere in words might sound more like a B. Um, the NG sound might have an extra sound like words like thing or doing might sound like think or doing. Um, and um, Arabic has fewer vowels than American English. So often Arabic speakers have challenges with the vowel I, like in did um, or him. They might say it with a more open sound, it might sound more like dead or hem. Um, Arabic speakers often also have some intonation differences. Um, so you can see here, if I click on Arabic, um, that there's a video outlining some of these um, main differences as well. Um, and so, yes, um, that's, <laughs> I could go into a lot more detail, but I definitely recommend getting that download and looking at some of those patterns and checking out those resources. Um, yes, okay, great, thank you. Um, another question. Um, the pronunciation of the word lurid. I find this first syllable very difficult, lurid. I find that kind of difficult too, honestly, lurid. Um, so first I have the L sound, but I go right into the er, lur, lur. Um, so it's kind of a short oo sound before my er vowel. Um, so if I think of about it as being kind of lur, lur, but then this all goes very quickly, lur, lurid. Um, so how I would break that down, I would probably start with the er, um, er, and then I would probably try ur, 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 and then I would try lur, lur, lurid, lurid. And I think the r, we kind of have to think about that as being on that last syllable, and then that helps a little bit with the lur, lurid, lurid. Um, I think you can either say a really clear ooh there, lurid, or lurid, lurid, where there's more of the uh, good book vowel, um, and focusing on having that er sound. That's definitely a challenging combination just because of the sounds in it, and I think most native speakers would have some challenges with that word as well. Um, okay, uh, Junior wants to know, does the A in have, and in ask uh, have the same sound. Yes, so both of those are the vowel a, have, and ask um, are the same. Uh, both have the a vowel, front and open. Um, um, and yeah, so a way to match those is you could say a phrase like, I have to ask, um, have you asked? Um, kind of trying to balance and and connect those two with each other. Um, Javier wants to know how to identify schwa um, used schwa y e. For example, qualification um, or qualification. Um, okay, so he's asking about qualification qua. Oh, okay. Um, I'm not sure. Qualify or qualify. Okay. So he's asking it if it if we have qualification or qualification. Um, and I would say in those unstressed syllables, these are almost interchangeable. What they represent is that we're very short and lax on these vowels. 
often when it's a letter I, we will say it more as an I or a letter E. And if it's a letter A or U, we'll say it more as an or O as an uh sound. I don't make a huge distinction between qualification with an I or qualification with an uh. And I don't think any listeners are going to hear a difference there. As long as I'm not spending extra time on that, as long as it's short and light, qualification, qualification. I think I maybe even said them exactly the same, even though I was trying to do two different vowels there. So that's a good um, observation that those are almost a little bit interchangeable in these longer words where they're unstressed. They're just the most typical vowel sounds used to represent that short, uh, lax vowel that we use in those types of words. Um, we have a question about 30 versus 13. Um, I do have a video about pronouncing numbers that talks about this issue, 30 and 13, as well as 40 and 14, etc. cetera. Um, if I write it out, it's a little easier to see. Um, I'm writing it with a flap sound. So 30 versus 13, uh, two differences. 13, I'm gonna stress the second syllable versus 30, I'm gonna stress the first syllable. That's the main difference. Secondly, in 30, my T becomes a flap, sounds more like a D, but in 13, since this is a stressed syllable, I'm gonna use an actual T there, 13. Um, so that happens also for 40 and 50 and 14 and 15. Um, if you are interested in finding out more and seeing help for that for numbers, um, I'm gonna recommend and show everyone how to search um, for that. So for example, if I'm on the free practice site and I use this search box, I'm just gonna type in number, numbers, and the lessons I have related to pronouncing numbers will come up. And you can see, um, here's a lesson for ordinal numbers like first, second, third. Um, and then um, here's a lesson about giving numbers over the phone numbers for pronouncing sixth, um, one and two. Well, there's a lot of lessons about numbers. Um, and there also will be a numbers video about 13 and 30. You can also use um, my uh, channel page, Speech Modification. Um, there's also on your laptop um, a search box there, if you're subscribed, that you can search all of my videos for um, for that as well. Um, thank you, that's a great question. And it's an important difference because we want to really clearly be able to hear if we're saying 13 or 30, if we're um, talking about something uh, important. It's obviously those two numbers can sound very similar and could be, if the stress pattern is um, not correct, it can be misunderstood as the wrong number. Um, you guys are welcome, thank you so much. Um, Yes, uh, I'm. Uh, you have great questions, and they uh, often are related to a video I already have. So I'm happy to direct you to those resources. And if it's not something I already have, oftentimes that's where I get my ideas for creating new videos for what people actually need. Um, we have another request for the name Carl. Yeah, that is a bit hard to say um, because we have the R and the L close together. Um, so I would kind of actually try to break it down to being a ah, uh, er, oh. Now I'm not gonna say carol <laughs> really slowly like that, but these are, this is why it's hard. There's all of these different vowel sounds happening. So because I have a dark L at the end, I have a bit of an uh, a bit of a schwa before it. And then anytime I have an R, I'm gonna have my er sound. And then with R, R, I have an ah, uh, er, glide. So I would start again with my er, and then I would add in r, so er, r, car. Uh, so that's just like how you would practice to pronounce the word car. And then once you have car very clearly, I would then add in my o, o, keep the back of the tongue back, but lift the front of the tongue for the l, o. And then carl, carl, carl. Um, yeah, breaking it down, saying each part and then bringing it back together and speeding up um, is typically a really good technique for any challenging word. Thank you for bringing that up. That's a, that's a difficult one. Um, okay, 
You're welcome. Um, so uh, we have a request about flap tea, um, for example, in water, it's hard. Yes, um, so the flap T sound, as you know, often comes in the middle of words between two vowels. And um, the difference between uh, T's are, if I use a true T, it would sound like water, t -t. there'd be a puff of air. Americans don't do that. They leave that puff out. They also turn their voice on. So it really sounds like a light little D sound, water, water. I want to avoid um, building up a lot of pressure and really stopping the air water um, because that will sound won't sound correct. So what I want to do is lift my tongue up. So if I sit if I say T t, t or D d, d, I can feel my tongue lifts behind my teeth. When I do the flap, water, water, my tongue lifts up there, uh, but just briefly and lightly with my voice on water. And then I release right into my er sound. What you might find um, helpful is, uh, it might be also that when the flap T is followed by an ER is more diff difficult. So you might wanna try it first with something like um, the word writing um, or betting. And if you think about the word betting or uh, writing isn't a good example, but the word betting, basically we pronounce these two words almost exactly the same. The only difference is this one might have a slightly longer vowel, betting, betting. Um, so it might be about training and reteaching your mind to just think about it as a D, and then that might help you get that flap T in those words. I do have a number of videos. Um, helping you with flap T and lessons showing you when you use a flap T. So check those out. Um, I hope those will be helpful for you. And um, yeah, that was a great question. Flap T is definitely very challenging. Um, Darlene would like to know how to pronounce safety. Uh, I would like to know how to spell safety. Sorry about that. So it's just like safe and T-Y in the spelling, safety, safety. And I think we use a flap there as well. So I don't say safety, safety. I use just a really light D sound. So if I think about it as safe D, safety, um, it's, yeah, it's a flap T, safety. Um, uh, good question, yeah. So uh, often T-Y um, in words like city, pretty, safety, we use more of a light D. Um, if you said safety, safety with a, with a puff of air, the aspirated T, people will understand you just fine. It's just slightly different than how a, the typical um, American accent. Um, all right, Marina wants to know, is there a rule about stress word in sentences? It is completely different from Brazilian Portuguese and I have a few clients who ask me that. I know how to do it, but cannot explain it properly. Um, Yes, so typically uh, for to know which word is stressed in a sentence, we tend to stress the last content word in a phrase. So if I had, um, for example, the phrase, um, I'm going to go home. The content words are the words that have more content to them, the nouns, the verbs, the adjectives, versus the little words like to or I'm, or the, or he or she, the, the articles, the pronouns, those are called the structure words. They kind of um, pull the sentence together with the grammar. The content words are the ones that have the most meaning. So here I have going, go, and home. These are all important content words. But because home is last, that's the word I'm gonna stress. I'm going to go home, I'm going to go home. The rest of this is fast, and then home is stretched out. If, um, if I'm changing the meaning, um, uh, for example, say I were to change it and stress I'm, I'm going to go home. That's also an acceptable stress pattern, but it changes from the standard meaning. The standard meaning, I'm going to go home, um, has the last content word stressed. If I'm stressing I'm going to go home, I'm highlighting that I'm going, and there's an implied meaning there that I'm talking about me, not him. I'm going to go home rather than you. Um, this one doesn't have as many options for changing. But what I would say is 
one way I teach this, if you're trying to teach other people, is to say, um, for example, if I could only say one word from the phrase, for example, of what's your name, what, what one word would you choose if you had to ask this question and you couldn't use three words? For me, I would choose name, and people do that, right? You could be, imagine someone asking your name and they might just use it with intonation. They might say name. Um, so while these words are important for the overall meaning, I can ask with just the single word. So oftentimes if there's one word uh, in a phrase that's the most important, that will be the word that's stressed. For example, um, it's his car. Most important, most content there is car. If I change the stress, it's his car, then I'm highlighting the ownership being more important. And I'm trying to tell you it's not someone else's car. There's kind of implied no there. All of this type of information, the, the information about stressing content words is on my intonation playlist. And I have a specific video about which words to stress, uh, how to stress content words. And I have some lessons and exercises that help you excuse me, work through knowing which things to stress. If you, if you get it intuitively, it can be hard to explain to someone else. And there are variations in rules, but that would be the main thing. The last content word in a thought group or in a phrase is the one that gets the stress. Um, okay, we have a question between towel and tower, um, or how to pronounce those two words, mm -hmm. towel and tower. Um, tau, they both have the same first sounds, which we, I call that vowel ow. In IPA, it looks like this, towel. Um, first, I have a dark L there. So there's uh, what we were just talking about in um, the BLE um, and comparable at the beginning of class. We still have the uh sound, tower, er. I just have my tight back er sound. So tower versus towel, towel versus tower, um, towel, tower. They also both have first syllable stress, so the o and the er are short and reduced. Makes it a little harder to pronounce them correctly, even though these are probably the most difficult parts of these words to pronounce. We have to try to be light and unstressed on them and lengthen on the tau part. Um, so again, building from the difficult part to the easier part. So starting with o, o, wool, towel, er, er, were, tower um, might be the best way to go in pronouncing those two. Um, all right, so um, uh, pronunciation of Ms, Mrs, Mr, and Miss. So probably the most useful way to examine the pronunciation here is to write them out. So Ms is an abbreviation that doesn't really have Maybe it does have a way of being spelled. Uh, I'm gonna just tell you the pronunciation of that. So that has a voiced Z sound, Ms versus Miss has the same two, first two sounds, but the voiceless S sound. And my clue there is that SS will often say S versus just an S will say Z more often. Mrs is, is like Miss with an S and an added syllable with a Z, Mrs first syllable stress, and Mr, again, um, the S sound, Miss, Mr, and then going right into the er vowel from my T. And again, first syllable stress, Mr. So Ms, Mrs, Mr, Miss. Um, great question, thank you. Uh, Marina has for a clarification, so she wants to know in a longer sentence, for example, how, I'm how am I supposed to do something like that? Um, so her sentence, how am I supposed to do something like that? My last content word, the rule still applies actually. Um, so Something like that is a clause that's at the end. And so if I separate it out as thought groups, how am I supposed to do something like that? So this is basically like three different chunks in the sentence. And um, 
in this sen in this phrase, I would stress do. How am I supposed to do something like that? Because the something like that is all one chunk of information. Um, uh, so even though it's a more complicated, um, uh, is even though it's a more complicated sentence with with three clauses together, the main information is about the verb do, and um, we have we use this kind of the same pattern repeating. So how am I? Um, the am would be the most important. It's supposed to do, do is last in the clause, it's most important, and something like that. Um, none of these words are content words, so none of them will get stressed. So because none of these are content words, this is basically the last content word in the overall phrase, that's why it gets the stress. Um, in another longer um, sentence, you might have different groups of words that go together called thought groups. In written speech, we have a lot of longer sentences. In spoken speech, whether or not I have a sentence or um, a string of phrases that go together, I'm gonna kind of have that pattern for each chunk of words and information that go together that the last content word in that chunk is the one that's gonna get stressed. Um, yeah, it's, it's fairly complicated. And I, I think helping people understand that would be by looking at building from shorter phrases and that how something longer I'm gonna say is made up of a combination of short, smaller, shorter phrases. Um, great, okay, so I see we're out of time for today. Um, we'll come back to some of the topics I had planned for today next week. So we'll look at some of the hidden letters and some of the requests that I didn't get to today. But we had wonderful questions from everyone today. Thank you so much for all the questions that you asked. I hoped I gave you good answers and as I said in the beginning, if you're watching this after the fact, if you're not here live, please feel free to ask your questions as well. I do go back and follow up through all of the comments, um, answering people's questions and directing them to where they can find information on the channel page and on my website. Um, I really enjoy uh, helping you find information that you're looking for. There's a lot of information out there and sometimes it can be hard to know um, what's right and what's reliable, and I, I do my best to be accurate and helpful for you. So uh, thanks so much for being a part of class today. We'll meet again next Friday at the same time, so I hope you can come back then and encourage others to watch the replay if you enjoyed the class. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, I recommend doing that because you can um, get notified then when we're live and when I upload new videos. And you can set the notification settings however you like, but then if you're subscribed, some of the things that are on the community page will come up on your homepage so you can see um, sneak previews of videos that are coming up. You can see some of the um, quick visual materials I make for you and some of the quizzes that you can um, test your knowledge in and find just little tidbits of information every day. So um, go ahead and subscribe if you haven't already and um, feel free to contact me with further questions. I look forward to seeing everyone next week. Uh, thanks so much for being a part of class today. I'm Christine Dunbar from speechmodification.com. Remember, if you want to sound American, you can do it. Speechmodification.com.